So this is week 11, Siemens, Siemens Timers and Counters. You have downloaded this PowerPoint and the lecture video is act, can be reached by clicking on this link right here. But since you're watching the video, you've already done that. You'll have to stop occasionally and follow some prompts and you'll fill out your video lecture worksheet as you go. Our outcomes are, we're gonna talk about task programs and routines, talk about periodic tasks, Talk about local and global tags. Um, talk about the retentive nature of subroutines. We're going to talk about asynchronous scanning. Um, and then we're going to talk about interlocks between two controllers. So let's start uh, a, a review of the following week about function blocks. So basically, we were talking about subroutines. Functions and function blocks are subroutines. They're similar to subroutines. Um, they need to be scheduled or they will not be scanned. So you have a main OB and you create these subroutines and then you have to schedule them either conditionally or unconditionally into your main program. And basically these subroutines or functions and function blocks are ways to organize code. And it's a way to reuse code because for our lab we were starting a motor forward and a motor reverse. And so instead of just generating the function block code over and over again, we just took the function block and scheduled it and then put different output on it or a different start button. And it was all kind of rewritten for it. It's almost like using a copy and paste. We learned that functions do not have memory. Function blocks do have memory because when you schedule the function block, a data block is automated, automatically created. When you schedule the function, it didn't have a data block with it. Local and global tags. Functions and function blocks can have uh, local tags, which were internal. They're not associated with a contact, a bit, or a coil. Um, whereas global tags are associated with a contact, a bit, or a coil. So that means that the global tags could be used in any of these things right here. The, the, the main OB or the function, the function blocks. But the local tags cannot be used in, in the main OB. They would be used internally to the subroutines. And another thing that was interesting is that this function right here could have a, a tag called Dorito. And this function block could have a, a tag called Dorito. And they wouldn't know anything about each other because they're local tags. Whereas if you had a global tag called push button one, and it was actually tied to an input, well then I'm pretty sure that there's only one physically physical real push button one. Now you could use that push button one tag as many times as you wanted, but that's the same tag that you're using over and over again. And you could use it in your subroutines or in your main. So the function or the function block has internal tags. So here is a function block that's scheduled. These are my internal tags run, auxiliary, contact, safety, whatever. These are all, I can tell, local internal tags because there's no IO on them. You know, you could use um, global tags inside of here if you wanted to, but these are, the, these auxiliary contacts, for example, are a, an internal local tag. And what we've done is we have tied the reverse auxiliary contact and the actual global tag to this internal tag. So we could take this motor control and we could schedule it again and again and again. And this could be reverse motor starter. The next one could be forward motor starter. The next one could be the reverse starter of motor two or motor three or motor four, no matter how many times we schedule this. And the auxiliary contacts would be the whichever real input we wanted or the run push button, whichever one we wanted to run, whichever output we used. Okay. So these can be scheduled conditionally or unconditionally. Sometimes it's useful to interlock the conditional call of these if an output is used more than once. You really don't want to use an output more than once. That would be a very unique situation where you do that, but usually you only use an output once, so it's easy to troubleshoot. It's better to use internal bits in maybe in, in an OR or something like that than use an output twice. Um, sometimes it's helpful to keep outputs in the main OB, and we've done some run jog examples. Okay, so let's take a look at this one. Is it is this going to work for a run jog? So 
what we have is a two functions. One's run, one is jog, and they're conditionally scheduled. So they're going to get scheduled depending on if the, the run jog button is made. And it looks like it's the same button because it, this button could only, can't be true and false and false and true because we programmed an open and a close. So it's either going to call the run or it's going to call the jog. So the jog looks like this. And for some reason, I toggle into the, into this into the start into the run. When I hit the start button, the motor will go. That seems pretty good. Now, if for some reason I switch the run jog here, and I, I unschedule one, uh, unschedule the jog, and I schedule the run. Well, here's what that looks like. If I hit the start, well then I've got memory. Okay, and then there you go. This will hold a memory. So inside of these subroutines here. I've used global tags because you notice when these get scheduled, there isn't any internal tags showing on these, okay? Versus here, there's internal tags showing that I then tied to global tags. This one, I just used, um, I just used the global tags internal to the subroutine, okay? Now, will this work? Now, there's a little bit of a problem here is that if I hit start right here and then I get the motor running okay and then I click the jog button here I unschedule the run one and so it's it comes up and it then reschedules the jog because you can only have one or the other and the motor will not be on okay but the problem is this will still show memory inside of here well this, if it was a function block let's say these were function blocks it would still show memory inside of here, okay? And that would be a problem because as soon as I click back into the run, this would automatically start up again. So you, this actually won't work. And as you get better at scheduling, you'll see that the retentive nature of subroutines when you're conditionally scheduling things can be a big problem. Here's run jog scheduling, uh, runner jog. So in this case, I see I've used internal tags here. And if you look here on my internal tags, well, there's no uh, I.O. on here. The I.O. is set up globally here, and it's associated with it. All right? So, once again, this is conditionally scheduled. I'm either hitting this toggle switch. It can only call this subroutine or this subroutine. I'm pretty sure because we're using the same input here, dot two that you can't have both of them on at the same time because one's closed and one's open. So this is the same logic that I used before. If, I, if the stop was true because it's a closed and the safeties were true because the overloads are closed, so we have true, true. When I hit start, the motor goes. Let's unschedule this and schedule this. Same thing, I get the motor here and then away I go. So what I did here was I took, um, the run bit or the jog bit, and, I, and I'm returning it to a motor here, okay? So I didn't want to take this right here, and I didn't want to put um, motor, and then I didn't want to reuse the same output and put motor here, because that would have been using this tag, motor, on each one of these, and you only want to use it once. So basically, this condition being true returns a bit, a jog bit, in this condition, returning true returns a run bit, and I just put them in parallel, and then I put the motor there. That way, I'm only using this once, okay? And so, the issue here, once again, is that if for some reason I'm in here, and I this was a function block, and I clicked, and this was true, and the motor brought itself on, okay? And then I unscheduled this, this is still going to stay on. So as soon as I come back into here, this gets scheduled, it gets scanned, and the motor would take off right, right away because that run bit, okay? Um, run jog program into a, a function block. So in this case, what I have is right here, unconditionally scheduled, unconditionally scheduled. So what I'm doing is it's running this subroutine, and it's running this subroutine, at the same time both of these subroutines are running but this subroutine can't be true and this subroutine can't be true at the same time because i put my choice button here my runner my jog or my runner my jog so even though these are both running at the same time 
Only this can be true and this is false, or this is true and this is false, because it's the same input. Therefore, I'm either going to get this jog bit to come on, or I'm going to get the motor to cause the run bit to come on. And so I've returned it to my parallel here, and then there's my motor, okay? So that's another way to do it, unconditionally scheduled, but then there's some condition, conditions that only allow this to run one or the other. Okay. Um, just want to remind you, e-stop is a not, and then we were using a toggle switch for a single input. Okay, so whether you used a toggle that switch, you know, that it can only be true and true here it was open, but we just used the, the toggle that that way only one of these conditions could be true at the same time. So maybe a better way to do the run jog circuit would be to do like we did in 131, where we have a jog button right or a jog switch right here. And basically when the jog selector is selected, basically what that does is it kind of turns the memory on right here. So unless this is if this is off, when I hit start, I don't get any memory. But when it's on, and I hit start, then I'm going to get memory. So this would be the programmed version of that circuit right there, the run jog. Okay, that's your basic run jog. So if I ran a run jog with extras, here's what my would look like. Let's say I had to have a forward switch if I wanted to go forward with this, and my safety systems had to be on, like my overloads. There's an, maybe this my e stop. Here's my overloads. Maybe I had to have an MCR on. All these things had to be true. And I put an electrical interlock in there. Remember, electrical interlocks are wired closed, so I couldn't have one motor on when the other was on. And then I just had a run jog switch. So when I hit run, I would either get the motor to come on, or if I clicked the, the, the jog switch, I could get memory on there. And remember, I used auxiliary contacts to hold here. We've already learned all about that. So there's a really fancy run jog with extras, okay? So if I took that right here, and I scheduled it. I would have all of these internal tags right here, all of these internal tags. And I would have to run I.O. to all these tags to satisfy them, okay? So what I would do is they're unconditionally scheduled, so this automatically runs. I have uh, my runner, my jog switch. So there you go, there's my runner jog. I'm determined if it's going to have memory or not. Forward or reverse, okay? So now we're going to take a look at this. Um, what I could do is I've got a, a forward starter here, and then if I reschedule this again, I would get the same item here, except I could put the reverse starter on here, okay? So when I have forward or reverse, that would either cause this to be true on this one, or it would cause it to be true on the next one. Run PB auxiliaries, because we when you run a forward and reverse, you don't want the forward into reverse to be on at the same time. E stop, master control relaxed, and re your reverse normally closed interlock. Okay, so that's the way you could take this and use it twice to do a forward and reversing starter. Okay, um, single input toggle in series with a run button. So there was other ways that you could do this, um, but this was the part, uh, that the last part of that lab about creating one function block that can do a motor starter forward or reverse and it could do it run or jog okay so um the week 11 are scheduling routines timers and counters this goes pretty fast because we've already done these items on the slip 500 we talked about a project uh, a plc project and this is showing an Allen Bradley control logic which is the higher level <laughs> that's everything for the task programs routines and we can do one project at a time so you've been working on a project okay and in a Siemens it kind of looks like this this is your project view it sits right down here in the bottom project view and you create a project and you save it and then what you do is you set up your CPU and later on and here's your tags and later on we're going to set up an HMI and everything like that all of that is in this tree format, and you're getting good at looking around your main and your tags and everything like that, okay? That's your controller that shows everything, okay? <laughs> For example, 
in here, if you look at this one right here, it looks like we've got all these subroutines running right here. Here's my main, and I've got all these subroutines, autopilot, ejection, manual, etc. And they're probably scheduled into the main. And right here is all my PLC tags, and you'll notice that they have um, bits and inputs and outputs queues. These are all my global tags that are being used throughout my program here. Okay, so that's the way the, Siem the Siemens organizer looks. So, Allen Bradley has three levels of scheduling. You have your task programs, routines. But what we have for Siemens, we have two levels of scheduling. We have our program blocks and then our routines. So, we've been working with our main OB and we've been scheduling routines into there. Okay. <clears throat> In these program blocks, um, we have the project and what we can do is we schedule this either with a continuous um, scheduling or a periodic okay so right now up to this point all we've been doing is continuously scheduling so when we take the main OB that's always scheduled and then we put a subroutine in there it's always going to get scheduled but there's periodic tasks that occur every once in a while okay that's another form of scheduling so continuous these have the lowest priority. They're always running, but they can get interrupted by something that has a higher priority, okay? So in a periodic block, we might have like a timed interrupt. So every, you know, one second, we might check for an error or something. So when a periodic task runs, what it does is it, every second, let's say, it would stop the main OB, and then it would run a periodic task, and then it would right away go back and run the main OB. The main OB has the lowest priority. This has a much higher priority, okay? So it could be timed, would be that. We could also have an event interrupt, okay? So that if something hit a limit switch or something, it would call um, a, a, a different type of a subroutine, an event block, and that would stop everything from running and it would only run the event block and then once the event block was cleared it then would just go back to run the program that you know the kind of the main program that we're used to programming and running then so these are different levels of scheduling okay so we're going to create a program block for a washing machine and we're going to start by creating the different types of programs with the scheduling and this uh, little video right here shows you how to schedule and program a washing machine Task types. <clears throat> Here's some examples of task types that you can study. So filling a tank to its maximum level and then opening a drain. That just might be the continuous task. So it's just always running that item. These are just continuous tasks. And this is what we've been programming in so far is just continuous tasks. But if you wanted a periodic task, you must check the position of, a, of something every 0.1 second and calculate rate. What, what this would do is every 0.1 seconds, the continuous task would stop, it would run this task quickly, and then it would go back to the continuous task and run and keep repeating that. And same with an event task here. If you had an engine test stand or a sensor, it would stop your continuous task, it would run this really quick, and then it would go back to your continuous task. So that's how that, that works. So we have our main program. Um, programs are not assigned to a task are unscheduled. So you could go ahead and do a program and you could get it all worked up but then just not schedule it and then when you wanted to make a change on some of these things and all of a sudden you could do some scheduling here and then then it would run okay but we've been working on routines here these are once again our second level so you can go ahead and you could program a function block or a function and you could use your inputs and outputs and everything but it won't the plc won't look at those inputs and outputs it won't do anything with your routine until you schedule it okay so the routine here is scheduled in um a language it can it can be programmed in ladder logic or it can pro be programmed in uh boolean or whatever it can't be programmed in both you got to pick one or the other to program it in okay so here's your routine languages you could do sequential functions chart structure touch function black ladder logic but you can't mix both of these now you could take the first function block and program it in this and the second function block and program it in this and the third function block and program it in this and then you could schedule them all under the main and that would be fine but you can't within its own routine you can't change languages okay 
So we've already talked about the routine types. We have a main routine, and we have our subroutine that gets scheduled, and then we have fault routines. Okay. And then in these routines here, they could be continuously scheduled, or they could be like a, they could be periodically scheduled. Okay. So now we're going to go ahead and create some washing machine routines. So you want to take a look here and watch the routine video there of how to do that. Okay, so now that we've got those created, we're going to go ahead and we're going to do a, a function block scheduling video and get those all scheduled up. So go ahead and take a look at your um, how to call the subroutines. Um, for tag-based addressing, we just want to remind you that Siemens uses a tag-based addressing structure and they give you meaningful names and they represent the data inside of the memory and um, I think you're probably getting pretty good at making tags and scheduling them. Just remember that the tag scope, if you have uh, global or controller scope tags, those are like your I.O. Or your, or your bits that you're using and you can use wherever you want. Versus the local tags are the tags used within the subroutines, okay? So, and these subroutines don't see each other. So you could have a tag in here, like I said, called Dorito, and you could have a tag over here called Dorito. And if this Dorito was, was on, the Dorito in here doesn't need to be on. It could be on or off because these don't understand, they, these don't see each other, okay? But if you had a global tag called Dorito, well, then it, if it's on, then it's on no matter where you use it. And if it's off, it's off no matter where you use it. That's the global tag, okay? <laughs> An alias tag is the name that we use for the data. So the base tag right here, this is for Alan Bradley, for example. This is on uh, slot two, it's an output and it's bit five. That was our, that's our memory address. And that's the base is the memory. But it's really hard to remember this, local two, zero, data dot five, whatever. So let's just call it fan motor, okay? And the, the fan motor is the alias for this data location. And therefore, when you go and you want to put your tag in, all you do is you, you click and you pull down and you find fan motor and there it is and it's and it's already addressed for you because you probably created that tag ahead of time. Okay, it's an alternate name for a tag. PLC data types. We uh, went over this a little bit. We've been using Booleans. Um, they're on or off, zeros or ones. Okay, and if you're using a timer, well, let's say you had a timer of like 200. Well, 200 is not on or off. It's not zero or one. A timer needs a number like an integer or a, a double integer. And these integers and double integers are binary numbers that can be solved to give you um, a number like 200 or 300 or 400. So when we were doing our pri prior, when we were doing compares and moves and everything like that, we were working with dints and ints, okay? That's our data types. And here's an example, and you want to pause this and look through here a little bit. These just tell you a sign in, S -S -I -N -T has eight bits. And so you work out the binary math that gives you ranges of negative 128 to 127 and ints and dents. Dents gives you 2 billion plus or minus 2 billion numbers that you can work with, okay? So what we're going to be working with today is timers, and it's very similar to the Allen Bradley. We have uh, TONs, TOS. There's a pulse timer, which is a little bit different, and um, they're added from the menu on the left, or you can just drag in the function block right here and then click on there and, and put in the timer that you want. You want to be sure the timer goes in as a function block like this, though, okay? So here's what it looks like. So programmed is a, in the FB format, format or the FBD look, which has a data block shown. So when you put this timer in, it get, it puts a data a DB in there, okay? Um, if you program it as a coil, it doesn't bring a DB in. So I recommend that you don't put it in as a coil. I'll say it again. Don't put that in as a coil. You want to program it like this, looking like a function block, okay? And so that function block brings in the data, the DB, and it keeps track of, you know, your accumulation, um, what's going on with the timer, and everything like that. You'll see it's pretty straightforward. It's, it's, it's kind of similar to uh, the Allen Bradley. Okay, so the way this works, IN is Boolean, so that's your scheduling. Is, it, is the timer 
true or false? Is it timing or not timing? PT, preset time is, is your word. ET is elapsed time. That's, you know, it's timing up. You know, is it one second, two seconds, three seconds? That keeping track. And Q is kind of like your done bit. Okay, that's your that's your done bit. So that's going to be the way that these timers look, whether you schedule them as um, ladder or whether you schedule them as FBD. And, and so once again, here's the comparison. IN is like the EN bit. PT is the preset time. ET is accumulation. It's like the ACC bit. Q is just like the done bit, the DN bit. So those, the bits are a little bit different than they were in the Allen Bradley. So you have um, a Siemens timer handout in, in your uh, item there, and it just kind of shows you all the time domains and how all the different timers and everything work like that. So if you're struggling with how the timers work, that uh, handout will give you all that information. So this is important here. Um, this is tells you that when you start programming, you have to, you're going to pause and you're going to read this, is that you can get instantaneous read of the timers and the Siemens because they're asynchronously scanned. That means that if you look into a timer in the middle of a scan to, get, to pull some information out of it, it automatically resets the timer. What does that mean? That means that when you are cascading timers, that when one timer starts another timer, if you look into one of those timers later on and try and pull the data out of it, it automatically resets the timer and it won't cascade, okay? So we'll look at that a little bit more. So here's a, you wanna stop and take a look at cascading timer example video. So here you wanna do, I got a couple different ways. You wanna blink a light using timer bits. Okay, so here I'm using the dot Q from timer zero, which is this timer right here. So this is automatically true because that's true. The light comes on. And this is automatically true because it's the done bit from this timer. So let's see. This times, here's the dot Q, it gets done. This times, that opens. This times, or this resets. It times, it closes. It times, it opens, it resets. Times. So here's your cascading like this, right? So this is okay. And the issue here is the light is on its own run. I like this a lot. I put the light on its own run. It's controlled by an XIO or an XIC. So we're turning this light on, you know, on its own run. And it's great. What I don't like or what's a problem here is that you're using the dot Q, okay? And so depending on how this gets written and how it, it's working, it's not going to work, okay? Because... If you move this light between the timers here, let's say light between the timers, well then this rung is accessing the dot Q here. And as soon as I access the dot Q from this one, it resets it. So this timer, is that's weird. This timer would reset and it would never start this one, okay? Because this one came in an order like that. So you'll see when you're using Siemens timers, you gotta be very careful. The best way to do it um, might be to use um, bits, okay? And so this is something here using an, o, an OT and a bit. So what I've got here is, once again, this is true, and I'm using an M here. So when this M gets done, then I'm opening the contact. So this will, this will work. I got the light here. The light gets done, starts this timer, this gets done, reset. Light back on. Here's my cascading back and forth like this, right? Okay, the thing that I don't like here is that now we have the light, and it's not on its own rung by itself. This light is at the mercy of this timer here. So something, this all this logic here needs to be true or something before this light comes on. And so we wanted to do something with that light later on. Well, then we have to chuck some logic in here, and then we're still at the mercy of this. So it's better to put this light directly on its own rung, okay? What I mean by that, let's take a look at this one. This is probably the best practice. The light's on its own rung all by itself, so we can control it. When this timer gets done, the Q gets done, it's turning on a bit. And so I'm using this M bit down here. I'm not using the dot Q. 
And when this timer gets done, it turns on M bit. And I'm using that M bit here. I'm not using the dot Q because I don't want to look into these timers and try and access that dot Q or it will automatically reset the timers. This is the best way. Have the timer turn on a bit. Have the timers turn on the bits. Have the bits control the coils and keep the light on its own run. Okay. Um, series, this is probably not a good idea. <laughs> It'll work. You got series done. So you got my timer turned on the light. The light gets done, turns on the timer. That gets done and resets. So the problem here is, once again, you got this light not on its own run. And it's kind of, if you want to do something later on with that light, it's kind of at the mercy of this timer run. And if you did something, do something with it, it might actually get this timing, which would then return the light off and you got a big mess here. Put that light on its own run. Siemens counters. A Siemens counter is going to be pretty straightforward. It goes in as a block instruction as well. You got reset, your preset value, which is a word. And your CV is your count value, and your Q is your done, like your done bit. So this is going to go in just like a counter, and it works just that you learned in Alan Bradley. You make the, the CU true, it counts up, false. True, it counts up, false. True, it counts up, and it'll keep counting up. So when the CV, the count value, hits the preset, you get the Q is done. Same thing here. It might be a good idea to take this Q and turn on a bit instead of using the, the counter dot Q. Okay, just depends on what you're going. So at this point, um, you would be done. You want to turn in your um, lecture worksheet and then take a look at the lab.